Hi everyone, welcome back to CSC 231. So hopefully you all have either gotten MATLAB online or MATLAB offline set up. Right now I am working off of MATLAB offline and of course a lot of these videos are going to be based off of uh, working in and navigating MATLAB offline but a lot of the stuff I should be talking about should apply both online and offline. So if you have successfully installed MATLAB Online or MATLAB Offline, uh, you may have gotten to something like this and you might be thinking, okay, now what? Well, starting with this video, I am hoping to teach you what you can do now with MATLAB. So as you can probably tell, there is a lot of stuff going on here. So the first thing we can really do is try to simplify what we're seeing. Now you'll see a few windows here in MATLAB Offline what we have right here is what's called the command window. This is where you can actually input commands and have MATLAB run the things that you're trying to run. This is called the workspace and we'll have some useful information that we will get into in a little bit. And right here we have a current folder, which basically this view lets you find folders in that might have MATLAB code. So really this is the only thing that's important. You, all the other stuff is optional, so you're free to turn on or turn off whatever you want. Uh, in order to do that, you can choose layout up here. There's all these different options. Right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of current folder because we're not working with uh, files whatsoever. We don't need to worry about that. And I'll keep workspace up for the time being, even though you know we don't have quite the information to really talk about what exactly will go on here, but once we start talking about things like variables, this will be super useful for us. Okay, so let's start working with the command window. Now, if we want to actually work with MATLAB code, we want to look at this command prompt here. That's what these uh, two greater than signs represent. That's basically where you start typing your code. So you'll always want to make sure that you click this area to make sure your cursor is there, and we can start doing stuff. So for example, I'll just do a really quick one plus one, press enter, and that gives me an answer of two. So basically what we have done is we have typed in input, in this case, one plus one, and it executes that addition and gives us an answer. So it says answer equals two. Now a really nice thing about MATLAB is that if sometimes you don't always want to display what the answer is. So I'll do two plus three, and I can put a semicolon there. And notice now that there's no output over here, but in the workspace, now we see that the answer is five. So the answer of the most recently typed in prompt is five. So in this case, it's hidden the output. So this might not seem super useful right now, but we'll get to some cases where it actually becomes really helpful. Uh, usually it's really nice to have when you don't want to crowd your input screen with a whole bunch of stuff. So something that's good to know with MATLAB is that we can actually type several commands on one line. So let's say I wanted to know what 10 minus 3, 4 divided by 2, and 7 plus 27 is. So what I've done here is I've typed out the three things I want to know and I've separated them all with commas. And if I press enter here, it gives the answers for all three of those problems. It's important to remember that it does work left to right when you have multiple commands on one line. And you can see that the answer here, remember this displays the answer of the last computation, ends up being 34, which is the result of 7 plus 27. So it displays the rightmost calculation, which was the one that was performed last in sort of this uh, queue of calculations that I asked it to do. Okay, so let's say I am trying to figure out 163 divided by 17 plus 3. So I'm going to do 163 divided by 17 plus 3 and oh see it looks like I've made a mistake because really I typed in 16 I really meant to try a 17. So let me try hitting backspace to correct this and uh oh now MATLAB actually has a problem with this you're not allowed to actually go back with your mouse and correct your previous output. So what you actually have to do instead is you press up. And if you do all this, this gives you a history of all of the commands that you've done in this session of MATLAB. As you can see, I have a lot of stuff before I started working on the video here. But this is the last command that I worked on. And uh, again, I hit the up arrow in order to get here. 
So now I can hit my left and right arrows to go and edit what I typed in before. So I'll change this to a 17. And all of a sudden, that's the answer that I want. I was looking for exactly 12.5882. So another nice one is, let's say I'm typing out a really long expression. And so on. And I'm let's say I'm getting it to a lot of text here on this line, and I don't really want to keep on going all throughout the line, so maybe I want to bring it down to the next line to improve re readability a bit. So what I can do is I can type dot dot dot, and that's going to tell MATLAB, hey, I'm continuing this calculation on the next line. So I can press enter, and notice that MATLAB hasn't executed anything yet. It is waiting for me to finish typing whatever I want. 13 plus 14 plus 15. And as soon as I hit enter again without typing a dot dot dot, it does that calculation. So that's all numbers from 1 to 15 added up together. Now one other note I want to make about multiple commands and semicolons is that it is possible for us to do something like 2 plus 3, 4 plus 5 let's say, and I'm going to put a semicolon after 4 plus 5, and then 6 minus 27 like this. Now what we have here is that any operation followed by a comma is displayed. So 2 plus 3 is displayed. The answer is 5 here. Now this 4 plus 5, this answer is hidden. So that just kind of goes into the void. And now 6 minus 27, this answer is displayed because there's no semicolon after it. So when you have multiple arguments, you can put a comma after an argument to say, hey, I want this answer displayed. And you can put a semicolon after an argument to tell the computer, I do not want this argument displayed. Now, let's say I'm working on a pretty complicated problem and I want to sort of let myself know, okay, well, this is going to be the start of the problem before I'm going to do a whole bunch of calculations that are going to help me on this one specific problem. So what I can do is I can actually type a percent. And when you start a command with a percent, you're telling the computer, hey, I don't want this line of text to be run as code. I want this to be shown as what's called a comment. And a comment, the computer completely ignores a comment. And this is just instead for a human reader. So either for yourself, if you're working on a really complicated piece of code, or for me when I'm grading it and you want to tell me what's going on. So for example, I can say this code is used to solve the sum of the first 50 positive numbers. And see, MATLAB didn't do anything about it. Answer didn't change at all. No output comes out of this. This is just a comment. And after this, I can do whatever code I want to do. So let's say I'm trying to calculate the sum of the first 50 positive numbers. Um, some of you re may remember that this looks that this would be 50 times, uh, and just as a quick note, we use an asterisk, that's the uh, the symbol above the 8, if you press shift and 8 on a US American keyboard. So that'd be 50 times 51 divided by 2 gives us the sum of the first 50 positive numbers, and if any of you want to ask me how I know this is true, I'm more than happy to show you the mathematical proof of this. But anyway, I'll use this code that gives answer equals 1275 and then I can say end code used to solve the sum of the first 50 positive numbers. So now I have a whole bunch of stuff on the screen. And let's say I want to clear this all out, give myself a fresh perspective, you know, a, a nice clean workspace to work on the next problem. What you can do is you can type CLC and press enter. And that clears the entire command window. So again, that's CLC, you press enter, and that clears the entire window. However, notice that the last answer still shows up in the workspace. And if I press up, I can access all the commands still. So really what CLC does is it's just a visual clear of the command window, sort of gives you a, a, blank piece of, a new blank piece of paper or a blank workspace to uh, work in. So I mentioned in the intro video that MATLAB is a matrix programming language, but that doesn't mean that all it does is work with matrices. There are plenty of operations to work with scalars. So we're just going to start off with some scalar operations and 
sort of expand our language from there. So for those of you who might not be familiar with uh, classes like linear algebra or things like that, uh, don't worry yet about things like matrices and scalars and all that. Basically, just a scalar is a regular old number. So in MATLAB, there are six fundamental operators where an operator basically takes one or two scalars and does some sort of transformation in order to produce a new scalar. So addition would be an example of an operator. We could do something like five plus three. What we have is we have the operator plus or the addition operator that is acting on five and three and it's going to transform them in order to create a new scalar, which in our case is eight. Our next operator is subtraction. So if we take something like five minus three, we have the subtraction operator on acting on five and three, specifically in that order, and we get two. Our next operator is multiplication. And I mentioned this before, but basically you would do the star symbol that appears above the eight on your keyboard. If you do shift plus eight, you usually get a star symbol on a US English keyboard. And this is our multiplication operator. So the next operator that we have is regular division, or as MATLAB likes to call it, right division. Basically, five divided by three is represented using a forward slash, the one right underneath a question mark on your keyboard, on most uh, American keyboards, that is. That's going to give uh, one and two thirds, which makes sense. But MATLAB actually defines a left division as well. And if we do five backslash three, this is actually going to be the same as taking three divided by five. So if you do five backslash three, and then three backslash five, they're the same exact thing. So left division is really just the same thing as right division with the uh, order of the operands switched. And finally, we have exponentiation. The way we do that is we can say five to the third power. We're using the caret key or the arrow key, which is above the six on most uh, US American keyboards. So if you do shift and six, you should get there. That's going to take five to the third power. So basically for all of these operations, except for left division, uh, you should all recognize these from say your calculators or something like that. Uh, left division is a new concept, uh, but you can basically think of it as the inverse of right division. So if we do something like one divided by five divided by three, and notice how I'm using parentheses here, in order to control the order of operations, just like you would in regular math, that's going to be the same thing as five left divide three, like so. So just like in real life math, in MATLAB, we actually have an order of operations. And you can think of it again, like PEMDAS. So the highest priority in any mathematical operation is the parentheses. So anything inside of, inside of the innermost parentheses gets taken care of first. After that, you have exponentiation. So anything that is taken to a certain exponent is has the second highest precedence after everything inside of the innermost parentheses are taken care of. After that, you have multiplication and division. So basically every multiplication and division that is taken at the same level of parentheses and exponentiation, all of those multiplications and divisions will be taken left to right. Import that's important to remember that multiplication and division happens left to right in MATLAB. Uh, failing to remember that can lead to a number of errors, which sometimes can be hard to debug without remembering your order of operations. So remember this so that you don't get into trouble later, and it takes us both uh, something like two hours in order to figure out that, oh, well, this is just a silly order of operations mistake. Uh, don't ask me how I know this will happen, please. And finally, we have addition and subtraction, also taken left to right, just like multiplication and division are.
Now I've mentioned that multiplication, division, and addition, subtraction, those steps are taken left to right, but I also should mention that any parentheses and any exponents taken at the same level are also evaluated left to right. So if I do something like three plus five divided by four plus two, the three plus five will be evaluated first, followed by the four plus two, and then the division of everything will be taken. So we'd be expecting to get, to get eight over six, which is four thirds, which is what we get. Now this doesn't make too much of a difference when it comes to just working with scalar values, but when we get to more complicated stuff, it could actually have an effect on the calculations that we're making. So just keep that in mind. Now here's a command that will be extremely useful for you to know, and it's called the help command. So if you want to know what a command does, you can type help and then the name of the command. So let's say we want to know help CLC, and that gives us a brief description of the command window. So let's take a look at another one, help format. What it's telling us is that form, the format command controls how numbers are going to be displayed. And it gives us all of these options for displaying numbers. I'll let you read the textbook or read this help message to really figure out which of your which of these formats is your favorite choice. Uh, for the most part, this is going to be up to personal preference unless I say something like, oh, well, I need this decimal out to like 15 decimal points or something like that. At that point, then you might need to actually change your format. Or if you want to do something crazy like hexadecimal format, all that kind of stuff, all of these options are in format. For the most part, you'll be able to do what you want. I'm a huge fan of scientific notation, so I'm going to personally say format long E. So now if I do something like 50 divided by 3, the whole thing is in scientific notation and we have a lot of decimal points, which is super helpful. Notice, however, that the value over here in answer does not change to scientific notation. This stays the same. Another thing I want to do is I want to do format compact. This is also described in the textbook, so I'll let you all read that. But basically, if I now do 50 divided by 3 again, it removes a lot of those blank lines that were showing up here. This is opposed to something like format loose, which then puts those blank lines back in. So the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about some built-in math functions, things that will make your life a little bit easier when you're trying to do some calculations. Now, I want to give a little bit of a forewarning that computers, computers are great. Computers seem really smart. They can do all sorts of calculations really fast, but really deep down, computers are really dumb. They are not smart at all. So if you try to tell the computer, hey, I want you to do this, but you don't precisely say exactly what you want the computer to do, it's going to flip out. It's not going to be able to do anything because it can't precisely understand what you're trying to say. When we're working with some of these MATLAB commands, you have to make sure you have everything precisely correct. You want to make sure that everything you use is spelled correctly, that you're passing the correct number of arguments to the functions, all that kind of stuff. So with that, let's talk about some functions. So a function is something that takes a specified number of inputs and returns an output based on the values of those inputs. And a function is designed to perform a specific transformation of those inputs of some sort. So we can look at, say, for example, the square root function, SQRT. Square root takes a single number. In this case, we could put something like 64. And it's going to give us the square root of 64. And in this case, the answer is 8. Now, a really nice property of function is that given a specific set of inputs, a function will always return the same output every time it is run. So, for example, if I want to keep on typing the square root of 64 over and over and over again, I can be completely satisfied that the square root of, that the answer to SQRT 64 will never change, that that output will always remain the same. And that's a property that will be important to keep in mind once you start developing your own functions pretty soon. So here's an example function description of the square root function. So what we have is SQRT X. What we're doing is we're giving the name of the function and we're giving the number of inputs and what we're naming all of those inputs. So 
what we have here is the function sqrt. It takes in one input called x. And down here, we actually describe what the inputs and outputs mean. So the input is always going to be some scalar named x. And the output will always be the square root of x. So this is another block of comments sort of describing another function, in this case, nth root. And I, I've typed this out personally. I, MATLAB didn't generate this at all. And the reason why I like to type these out is because it helps you remember a lot of things like the name of the function, the number of inputs, what the inputs actually are, and what the function does based on those inputs. So we have nth root. It takes in two inputs this time. Both of those inputs are scalars. One is called x and the other is called n. And the output is the nth root of x. So if we do nth root, 8 and 3. So we're passing in 8 as x and 3 as n. And based on our output, what that's telling us is, oh, well, this is going to take the nth root of x. So we would expect the cube root of 8 or 2. And that's exactly what we get. Again, with computers being dumb, the computer is going to read in you saying, oh, take the nth root of x and n, and it's going to assume that x will always be the input on the left, and n will always be the input on the right. So if I were to, if I was to say instead, oh, we'll take nth root of 3 and 8, maybe I accidentally switch up the inputs, the computer is going to say, okay, well, x is 3 and n is 8, so obviously what you want is the 8th root of 3. And that's not what we want. Really, what we're looking for in this in this example is the cube root of 8. So you always want to put 8 in for x and 3 in for n. So I'll just reiterate this one more time. The order of your inputs for a function is really, really important. You can't mix that up. So here are some more. So here are some more basic functions. We have the exponent function, absolute value, log, natural log, log base 10, and factorial. Uh, you are welcome to pause the video or check yourself on the, in the textbook. It should be somewhere around page 15 if you want to look at those yourself. Also on page 15 of the textbook is a lot of trigonometry functions. So sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, all that kind of stuff. They are given in both radians and degrees. So for example, if you want sine of x, that's going to be the, uh, sine, the value of sine of x in radians. If you want, if you want that value in degrees, that would instead be sine d of x. So if you look at sine of 90 degrees, that's going to give you some really weird result. Instead, if you do sine d of 90, that's just going to give you one, which is what we're expecting. Here are a number of functions that deal with rounding in some way. So as you can see, there are many ways to round some scalar x to the nearest integer. You have round, which just straight up rounds x to the nearest integer. You have fix, which rounds x to the nearest integer closer to zero. Seal rounds x up to the ne nearest integer that is larger than it. So it will always round x up. And floor rounds x down to the nearest integer less than x. So it will always round x down. And it's important to note that fix, if you call fix x on a positive x, that will basically act as a floor function. And if you call fix x on a negative x, that will act as a ceiling function. Then you have rem of x and y. And that basically, what you do is you, you do, you think back to your long division days of pre-algebra math, and you do long division of x divided by y, and whatever your remainder is, that would be the result of rem x and y. So for example, if we do rem of 5 and 2, that would basically be the remainder of 5 divided by 2. And what we would get is 2 remainder 1. And that answer is what we are expecting. And then sine, basically it just gives a scalar representing the sine of x. So if x is positive, sine x returns negative 1, like so. Sine of x just returns a scalar that in some way represents the sine of x. So if x is negative, it will return negative 1, like so. Sine of negative 22 should be negative 1. If x is 0, it just returns 0. So sine of 0 is 0. And finally, sine of, let's say, this crazy number that is greater than 0, this should return 1.
So this is a very basic introduction to MATLAB. We're going to get into some more complicated stuff in the next video, so I just decided to end it right now. Uh, what I would do is spend some time playing with some numbers, playing with some of these functions, especially the ones that I kind of glossed over for lack of time, and just get yourself familiar with some of these functions before moving on to the next video. Well, I'll see you all in the next video.